Alright, it's time for another video. Today I'd like to talk about free will and moral responsibility. So the idea, generally, whether we're talking about free will in a theistic or a theological context or set just completely secular, the idea is that if we say that you don't have free will, if we say that a person lacks free will, then how can we hold them morally culpable for their actions? How can we say how can we punish them, essentially? How can we, we put any blame on them? If, the, if somebody goes out and murders a bunch of people, you, you say, oh, well, they didn't have freedom. They didn't have any free will. They didn't get to ch make that choice. It, it was because of the past uh, actions or the circumstances of their existence that led to them being that way. They were born with certain predispositions, and then they, you know, part of it's biology, part of it's the way they were raised. Whatever it might be, you can always go back if you're a hard determinist, and you would you would have to say, well, we can't hold them morally responsible. Now, I'm not going to get into soft determinism versus hard determinism and compatibilism and all these various things. That's not the point of this. What I'd like to do is sort of frame the free will and moral responsibility issue in a, a theistic or a theological uh, framework. Because even theists that I taught, engaged in, um, engaged with, across the board practically, will argue that the same way. They'll say, oh, we have free will, so that means we have the freedom to choose good or to choose evil. And if I say, if I come along and say, oh no, we generally don't exercise free will, we generally don't exercise it, which is what I say. They'll go, oh, well, then, if that's true, then, then nobody's responsible. Nobody can be held responsible or, or culpable for their actions, and none of this makes sense. And it's just like, well, I think the first thing to attack there is the idea that we are culpable or we are responsible based on the fact that we're free. I don't think that's correct. I think that's actually incorrect. I would say, I'm going to put this out there first, and we'll go back and kind of work through it backwards, I suppose, but I will say straight out, we are not free because, or we are not responsible because of free, having free choice. We are responsible because of identification. The entire idea of spirituality, of spiritual teachings, and I mean in a religious context, I mean in a, a theistic, very specifically a theistic context, because I can't account for every, every new age bit of woo that comes out that says, oh, you know, spirituality means this. It means being in the na in, in, by some trees and breathing the tree air and whatever the hell. I mean, that's all well and good. I'm not saying that's bad, but in this context, I'm talking about theistic uh, spirituality. Everything worthy of the name, uh, every theistic sense of spirituality as, as being that pertains to God, right? Spiritual being meaning that it pertains to God, it pertains to the eternal that's all based, whether it says it blatantly or straightforward or it's just implicit, it's all about identity. It's about self-realization, it's about understanding that you, what you are and what your eternal occupation is. That's all it comes down to. So, when you have perfect identity, when you have true identification, you understand that you are part and parcel of this absolute being that we call God. That's the idea. So in that state, you act in a relationship with God. You, your, your occupation, your eternal dharma, your sanatana dharma, or your eternal occupation, is to be in a loving ser relationship with God, is to be in a state of devotional service with God. That's essentially what it comes down to. Whether you're talking about you're a Christian, or you're Muslim, or you're a Jew, or you're a Hindu, etc. It's all ultimately boils down to that. So, moral culpability pertains to the identification with your actions and the hankering after their results. This is Bhagavad Gita 101. If you read the Bhagavad Gita, which I can, I'll put a link down below, I recommend. Um, the entire book is online. Like, you can just read it. It's a lot of reading, but if you just want to go through it, and there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, but yeah, basically, it's the idea that you identify with your actions and you hanker after the results. It makes you, it ties you to those results, it ties you to the blame, to the responsibility. That's, what, that's basically what it boils down to. Um, 
And I think that gets lost with a lot of people. I, I've been debating this with a, uh, another theist on, um, in a Facebook group recently. And it's, it's difficult to, to, to explain because it's not that we don't have freedom when we're choosing the different worldly options. It's not that we don't potentially have freedom. It's that we're not using it. We're just not using it. If I have column A and column B, and they're both pertaining to worldly sense gratification, it doesn't make a difference. I can have the illusion that I'm choosing column A instead of column B, or vice versa. But it's all just an illusion. It's not actually freedom. Maybe in some roundabout way, it alludes to freedom, or the, the fact that we have it. But it's not in itself an exercise of free will. We're not free until we get to that platform of being conscientiously in a loving service attitude toward God. That's, that's, boil, that's what it boils down to, at least for theists. You know, I mean, in a secular sense, I, I have no real, I really have no say as to whether we have free will or not. Um, the whole, I think the whole conversation with the person on Facebook started because of a Sam Harris quote. And I know that he doesn't believe in free will, but he has completely other reasons, you know. He doesn't allow, as far as I know, he doesn't allow for any possibility of free will, which I would understand that if I didn't have any belief in anything spiritual, anything beyond of an absolute God that we are part and parcel of, if I didn't have any of that stuff, I would say, yeah, that's it. We don't, we don't have free will. We have all this, you know, it, it, you know, at least it seems to be that way um, to me. But... I think maybe the, it's not even that I'm committed to that either. I shouldn't. I should, really should say that I'm not committed necessarily in a secular sense to say that there is no free will. It's just that I don't think there should be as much emphasis on it. It's sort of like when people talk about God as the creator. I think there should be less emphasis on that idea since it's not an intrinsic or inherent uh, characteristic for God. In the same sense that being all knowing or being, you know, the the supreme controller or the supreme powerful being or whatever. Those things are intrinsic to what we mean by God. Being a creator is just incidental. God happened to have created things, and we therefore identify God as creator. If nothing had been created, God would still be the same being. It just you wouldn't call him a creator anyway. I think I've talked about that in previous videos, so I want to get off track. But just the idea that we can... Uh, I feel it's necessary to reject the, uh, the notion of free will so open, that the, of it being so openly the case in our day-to-day -day lives because it's, there's too much emphasis on it. In fact, thinking that you're free is a pretty good sign that you're very much not. It's, you go about your day and you think, I'm free, I have free will, I can do this, I can do that. That's generally a sign that you don't have free will. So, that's all I have to say about that. And, uh, go and... Hopefully you guys leave comments down below or make video responses. And see you later.